biggest regret of my life was was at this party and it was a party for everyone was there it was a big do it was the t it was the 10th anniversary of handmade films you know this was the company that made the With thing so we had this great big party at Pinewood Studios and George because he said, well, it's my party, so I'm going to play uh, with my friends at this party. And then suddenly there was this stage unveiled. We were all plastered by this point. It was about... <laughs> and, George, and he came over to me and he said, you sing, don't you? I said, yeah. And um, <laughs> he, he said, get, do you want to get up? And I said, George, man, I'm like... I'm." plastered he said everybody here is plastered um, and I bottled it I wouldn't I didn't have the courage to get up welcome everyone to a his a walkthrough time with Paul McGann um, my name is Amanda Prescott if you don't know who I am yet long time LA who volunteer cosplayer and now freelance journalist um, just as a caveat for legal reasons if there's a production I don't mention here in Paul's history it's because it might be struck we want to make sure we're not um, breaking strike rules accidentally so well you'll get stuck I won't, <laughs> I won't, won't for sure yeah. just trouble. in case if you didn't hear me mention anything it's just I don't know what the rules are right now they're very vague but to start our conversation our walk you moved you moved nearer then to, well yeah because like a, it was a little bit awkward and echoey, oh. so yeah can we do something about the lighting yeah, yeah let's do it yeah. it's like take away this um Casino lighting. Yes, Maybe, is it right? There you go. There we okay, go. There we, there a bit go. more nice. of a casual conversation, of course. Yeah. Does anyone want right. any incense we can burn? <laughs> <laughs> to, yeah. Just so basically, this panel's so about everything off. that's not Doctor Who. So when it's time for questions, make sure your questions are not about Doctor Who or Big Finish. So because Paul has done a lot that's not there. So to start with, yeah, no problem. Oh, there you are. There we all are. There you all are. You can see all clearly. To start with, how does it feel to have a movie in the Criterion Collection? Because with Noel and I is, when I w opened it up, I was like, wow, it says the Criterion Collection. It's very fancy. How's it feel? No one's ever asked me. Is that a, is that a big deal to, to be in Yes, it, it means your movie is a classic. I never knew that. <laughs> How did I get to 63 without learning? That? Is that is that yeah, right? Yeah, because you're you're in there with many Oscar winners and other and independent well, well, film well. classics. So how was the well, well, well? <laughs> so well, there's the answer to your question. I didn't know. I didn't realize, <laughs> and now I realize, and I'm completely chuffed, which is American for stoked. We decided it was stoked. Chuffed equals stoked. There's a there's a woman down the front who's bilingual, so she. <laughs> She's going to help interpret. So take us back to 1986 or 85 when the, pr the production company, you know, approached you. What attracted you to play that character? In? With Noel and I. Uh, well, the, his name is Marwood, but... The man who wrote and directed it. Yeah. How uh, he attracted me to it. No, actually, quite... Uh, honestly, quite... This mic's terrible. Um, he's one of the most physically attractive people. No word of a lie. Bruce Robinson, who wrote and directed with Neil and I, he looks like an angel. He did. He probably still does. He's 70-odd, but probably still is extremely beautiful. I, for, for those of you that may have seen with Neil, there's a, there's, um, Richard Grant has some dialogue early in the picture where he's talking. He's reading a newspaper and he's talking about, you know, some boy, boy who lands <laughs> a job for a top Italian director. And, you know, and he's, and, and he's with Neil's rather bitter about it. Well, that was Bruce Robinson. Ah. Bruce, Bruce had been this rather beautiful boy, this actor who straight from school had gone to Italy to shoot uh, Romeo and Juliet, Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet. So that, that's him. Anyway, so in answer to your question, that's, and I, went, I was sent to this building. Mm -hmm. um, there was no script. In fact, my agent, she... In, a, in this phone call, she said, it, darling, it's a, it's a thing about Whistler. That's very vague. And, right, so in, and in those, a, well, and it was in the mid 80s among this sort of rash of pictures about artists and failed romantics, that kind of thing. I thought, oh, it's, it's another one of them, it's about the American painter. And I got there and it was with Nail. And this guy stood in the doorway and he'd seen me on TV. And he said, I hadn't even sat down. He said, you've got the job. 
Oh wow, that's and that's never happened before or since. And then, I, and then, yeah, seriously. And then I was really nervous. And he said to me, "Will you, would you mind uh, staying mm. to read with prospective with nails who were going to come in?" And, and that's yeah. what I did. And I stayed the rest of that day and some uh, the next day. And then he fired me. Anyway, what's your next question? <laughs> well, actually, with that's all, the truth, though. That's hysterical. I mean, with No Lie, for people who haven't seen it, it is a movie about two struggling artists. They are. They are broke, starving, the apartment are in full of rats, and then the Withnell's uncle is rich, lives in the country, and he borrowed, lets them borrow a country house for free, so they get out of London, and then it becomes a very weird character study, conflicts about identity, and, you know, money, because yeah. they're really, really broke. It's the saddest film you'll ever see. Yeah, and there's a really wild plot twist, but looking back on it do you do you think the movie was making a political statement of the time or reflecting because it's set in the ni late 1960s but it was made in the 80s do you think it was made as a reaction to Bruce, Thatcherism or anything like that no um, not overtly mm -hmm. Bruce Robinson is one of the most political people mm -hmm. angry he is a 60s person you know he's, he um, he was he was in his 40s then very angry about the state of the country we were in. And he said, there's politics in this picture, in this script that I've written, he said, but it's not overt. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, you'll find it, and if you know, you know. He said, I could easily have written some screed about, you know, some, some thing about politics. And he, and he went on to do that yeah. in other pictures that he did. In fact, he, he also showed me, um, once we'd been working a couple of weeks, he showed me a script that he'd just finished for Germinal, Zola's book of Germinal, yeah. you know, which is a which, you know, this great novel. And Bruce had got the job; he'd written this thing, and that was political. That was, of course, that for you that know the stories about this miners' strike, and there was a miners' strike that had just finished in Britain. So yeah. yes, he was really political. But with Nail, the politics are really, really skillfully and artfully hidden. Mm -hmm. um, he once said to me, "If you could." keep one line, the whole point of the picture, if you could keep one line of dialogue mm. that explained the whole story, it would be the line where, so glad you could make it, oh my so word. So glad. <laughs> Let me recap on what you've missed. Um, the, there's a line where the two boys go to the uncle. Yeah. Um, and Withnail gets the key to the cottage, the country house. Yeah. And, I, and my character says, how did you manage that? And he, and he says, the reply is, he says, cheap to those that can afford it, very expensive to those that can't. That's the point of the film. Yeah, it, that, there's, the politics, there's the politics of the film. Now, Withnell anyway. is also known for another reason. There's a very He's famous- He's a coward. Coward. He's, there's yeah. a very famous producer behind it. He is, did you ever get a chance to work with, the, uh, with one of the Beatles on this film? Because he is one of the producers. I forgot which one. It's George Jason. Harrison. Harrison. Yeah. There we go. Harrison. Harrison. Ringo turned up. Really? Yeah. There's a. F I bet you'll find it. There's a photo of me and Bruce Robinson and Ringo Starr. Ooh. On the set. Ringo. <laughs> probably for like dodgy tax reasons. Ringo turned up one day on the set. Because <laughs> in, in the in the the end credits, you know, Richard Starkey, MB, he gets this kind of credit. I mean, I think I, think, I, I remember he, he was married to Barbara Bach at the time. Um, and mm -hmm. his house had just burned down. He had a house in the States. Just, anyway, so he showed up in England, and uh, I'm sure there was something kind of half shady. You'll batter me if he ever hears me telling you this. But um, he turned up on the set one day, and uh, the photographer happened to be there, so there's pictures of us. So Ringo was there. Yeah. George I later met okay. um, at a party that they threw, and he was really sweet, George. I really, really liked him. Um, also... The biggest regret of my life was was at this party, and it was a party for everyone was there. It was a big do. It was the t it was the tenth anniversary of handmade films. You know, this was the company that made the With thing. So we had this great big party at Pinewood Studios, and George, because he said, "Well, it's my party, so I'm gonna play." Uh, with my friends at this party. And then suddenly there was this stage unveiled. We were all plastered by this point. It was about <laughs> two in the morning. And, George, and he came over to me and he said, you sing, don't you? I said, yeah. And um, <laughs> he, he said, 
get, do you want to get up? And I said, George, man, I'm like, I'm plastered. He said, everybody here is plastered. <laughs> Um, and I bottled it. I wouldn't. I didn't have the courage to get up. No. That's me and Ringo. That's oh Bruce, wow. That's Bruce Robinson on the right. There's little Ringo, and there's there's yours truly. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Why don't you shut up? And, 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 um, <laughs> there's always one, isn't there? There's always and, um, <laughs> my that. dad. My dad, when he saw this picture, he laughed. He said. He said, that pose. He said, look, look where my left hand is. He said, ever since you were a child. <laughs> he said, you've had your hand on your eight knee. That's an old English, oh, an old English expression. Every, apparently every picture, when, even when I was little, I've been standing there like this. <laughs> that is a great photo. You can sort of, oh no, you can't really see people in the background. But, it's um, a great photo. But, but it, it kind of dates the picture. You know, we shot this picture in the mid 80s. Everyone thinks, I don't know. I've actually had people ask me if we shot it in the 60s. It does look like that. And it and said, looks run down too in like broken camera too. It's that whole effect. Of it. Yeah. It's great. There's Ringo, look, throwing his head back and laughing. Yeah. That's Bruce Robinson and me. Anyway, um, happy days. Happy but days. I never got up and sang with George. And there, was, there he was with Carl Perkins and Eric Clapton and Joe Brown and Klaus oh, Vorman. Um, anyway, and I bottled out. Man, that is, because, yeah. That is a really so big Sometimes regret. you just got to say yes. You've just got to. And, and ever since then, I've always just said yes. I'm just going to do it. To things, even if they seem reckless. Yeah, absolutely um, reckless. I've said, yeah, go on. Now. Find me another one. Catherine. Okay. So you were in a 1995 production of Catherine the Great. And also, oh, yeah. The Hanging Gale came out the same year. These are two period dramas about wildly different topics for people who haven't seen them. But what came first for you, playing Potemkin or playing struggling priest in Ireland, suffering from the potato famine, Liam Fallon? We did both at the same time. That's a yeah, wild. Yeah, we I went from one set to the other. It's the only time, actually it's not, but I, um, that lasted months. Yeah, they overlapped. That's great. Yeah. So how did you get into the mindset of playing like one of the richest, most powerful guys in history and playing <laughs> a starving priest in a... Any uh, suffering from the family? You, know, you know what I did? I just parted my hair on the other side. And then, <laughs> that's how actors do it. <laughs> that's that. That's all the character kind of. It's all the prep you need. Just, just go. Oh yeah, just, just part just, on the other side and get out there. And, so yeah, it's just yeah. the costume that solves it, basically. What? Just the costume that solves it. Completely. Same long hair. What are we looking at? Oh, that, yeah, this is the that, that that is how I got the Doctor Who gig. Really? That's it. Hanging Gales are audition tape. That is wild. That's th th this is true though. That 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 is that's the boy that Phil Siegel saw on the TV and oh, said, wow. "Who is that? That's my doctor." He told me this. Phil Siegel told me this. Um, and I, we spoke about this the other day because um, this is that, that was a th 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 this is a I'm dressed as an 1840s Irish priest, but look at the hair. That's the doctor, isn't it? It is. Mm. And. Um, but again, I, I, and forgive me if you heard this before, yesterday, but uh, Phil <laughs> sorry, Phil couldn't tell me and my brother Mark apart. Ah. So we both had to audition for, for who. That actually happened. But that's what he saw. And that's speaking... How I got the gig. And this was at a time in whatever, where, when, when did we shoot that? 94. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the, the, the so-called movie is two years away. Um, but we're already hearing rumors four or five years after Doctor Who's already finished. Doctor Who finished in 89. This is 94. There's me and my brothers. Yeah. Um, and we're hearing things like, oh, yeah, they're going to bring it back. And who, who plays Mr. Bean? Um, Rowan, Rowan Atkinson. Atkinson. Rowan Atkinson's going to be the doctor. <laughs> uh, or Eric Idle is going to yeah. be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you could kind of picture it, couldn't you? Yeah, well, yeah, well that's kind of feasible. Yeah. And then um, Phil calls me. Wow. Yeah, that was weird. There we are in Ireland in uh, 94. Now, actually, I want, this is what intrigued, intrigued me. because <laughs> my brothers. That's all Stephen. of the brothers are yeah. here. Because most of the times in America, we only really hear about you or Stephen because of, you know, his really famous show called The Midwife. Um, yeah. What was it like working with all four of your brothers? A bit intense. Well, of course, the I story itself. Lie, it was, it yeah. was intense. Um, we worked together twice in 40 years. We worked together once on stage. Mm -hmm. I'm going to change this mic. I don't like it. Sure. Um, maybe that one. Try that yep. one. Um, I sound like Lee Marvin. Um, you know, when he's, 
I was born <laughs> under the one. One, two, one, two, one, two. Is that any better? No. Anyway. Um, what don't you like about this? One? I don't know. I just, I think I just thought I'd change my look <laughs> with this one. Um, that's Stephen on the left. Mar Try that. What? Stereo. Hello there. No, no. That one's not working. Oh, the switch was not. Duh. Hello, hello. I don't know. One, two, one, two. That's fine. Um, this was a thing that we... Um, these are my brothers, and there are about... There's four of us and about five years between us. So we're all kind of the same age. Um, and we played brothers in this... It was a BBC Northern Ireland drama. Yeah. That, uh, that Stephen... Uh, kind of wrote up and we approached the BBC to do it. Uh, and that year they did it and it was a big Sunday night thing. It was in four parts. Um, and it was about the great, well, it was set during the Great Famine in yeah. 1840s Ireland. And we soon realized why no one had tried to do a thing about the Great Famine in Ireland, because it's too hard. Um, we tried our best and rather ingeniously the story was set in one small place, one village. It, it never left the village. So it's kind of, you know, this was, was a microcosm. There was one English character in it. He played all the Brits, effectively. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so Michael that, Kitchen was the Brit. Michael Kitchen, he was great, yeah. He was, how was like, it like working with him? Because he's a legend. He was legendary. <laughs> <laughs> to work with, and he was fantastic. You know, and he's got a very, Michael's got a very kind of, um, you know, he's very kind of internalized, still, quiet style, which kind of suited, it suited the, the drama. He was terrific. Um, and it was kind of good, it worked, you know. It worked about as well as, you, as, well as we hoped. It was a feather in our caps. Um, did you do any prior research about the famine in, in, um, prior to taking the role on, or did you learn in school, about it in school? They don't teach this stuff in school in the UK, wow. um, and they should. That's a shocker, because in New York State, in the public schools at least, they're required to talk about the famine. Yeah, I wish it were, it was, it's not even required now in Britain. But people don't know Irish history in Britain. Um, and, and our family, the reason that our family was in Britain was because of the, because of the famines, you know, they arrived in Liverpool at the time. Um, and it was only when we found this out wow. um, that we decided, you know, it might be an idea. When we were kids, and you know what, there's a neat kind of connection. It was when Roots was on the TV in the 70s. Yeah. Um, you know, you know what Roots is. Yeah. Um, and... Um, We'd simply, we were, you know, young kids watching Roots. When was that? Mid-70s? 76? Yeah. 77? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and we, uh, we were going, well, where are we from? And mm -hmm. let's, yeah, it, was, it was literally that. Where, where, where did we come from? And um, we kind of knew we were ice, but we, we'd never sort of, anyway, that's how it happened. Yeah. And then we ended up working with Marvin Chomsky. Wow. On Catherine the Great, the same guy who shot Roots <laughs> shot Catherine the Great. That is such a there I, you go. Nice that's such a wild part. historical connection. Yeah, production connection. So you know, so our family ended up in Liverpool from Ireland in the eighteen sixties. But yeah. um, next question. Okay, so <laughs> after timeline wise, after the famine, we now are traveling the high seas with Horatio Hornblower. How did that develop? How did that develop? Yeah. They called me and after like two, they'd been, they'd shot two series of it. Yep. Um, then I got a call. I, I, there's, there he is, Lieutenant Bush. There we go. Nice and late 18th, early 19th century yeah. finery. Yeah, I came into the third series and um, I wish we were still making them. Oh yeah, I mean that's I a... I wish we were still making we, uh, I, I, we were just about to run out of books, you know, there's only so many like novels. Yeah. Um, and then Johan Griffith, the, the lead actor, we lost him. It's a mm. superstar. He came here to, what did he make, like Marvel thing? He came over to this, what, what, Fantastic Four. Fantastic Four. Yeah, we lost him and then we couldn't get him back. <laughs> so uh, it's now 20 years, so we're, we're all too long in the tooth now to carry on shooting them. For but sure. I had a ball doing it. I'd never been on the sale before. Um, and we, you know, we shot these series in these kind of paradise islands which was a right hoot. Oh, of um, 
Do you I, think you could survive as an 18th century sailor? Not for a week. <laughs> no, no, no. And yet, and all there he is. There's Johan. Yeah. I mean, all my all the men in my family were sailors, but um, no, no, just no. no electricity. Nah, I'm too. N I'm too weak. Also, too diseases because there's no vaccines. No. <laughs> yeah. Now, getting I'm, away from historicals for a bit, because I found this really wild, and it came up in a, another panel yesterday. There has to be a funny story behind you working on vampire killers. Now, that's the U.S. title. The U.K. title is lesbian vampire killers. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's, no, it's a, a masterpiece, weird... folks. <laughs> and also, don't, don't be put off. It's a, it's a, it's a quiet masterpiece. And how was James Corden? Because he's got a lot of heat these days for a lot of different things. But how was he back what? when you worked with him? Uh. James Corden, James Corden is one of the most ambitious people I ever, but in a way that, um, there, there we are. There we are. I know, I know. He was, yeah, I mean, I got on with him, but he's, he's, James is quite, um, what's the word? He's not, he's not, well, he's not, he's not the friendliest person. Mm. He's a clever boy, though. He was, you know, I really, um, and he asked me to do it, and I said, yeah, and, uh, but he's, he's more intense than one of my brothers, Ooh. James Corden. Yeah. The other boy's really lovely, but James, I mean, look at what he's gone done. He's like, he's now the industry, isn't he, James Corden? Yeah. Honestly. But he was always going to, yeah, even then, when you met him then, you, you could just tell. There's always, you know, th he was just going that way. Um, you could tell. And you either kind of got on it or you didn't. And um, I don't know, he was, I don't know if he liked me or not. Uh, I don't know. He was just one of those people. Did work in this movie change your views on spirituality or religion or no. the existence of vampires? No. No. <laughs> no. No, working on pictures tends not to, yeah. you know. Um, I can't think of a picture that may, might have, certainly not that one. <laughs> I, the, 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 pro, thing, the thing is about the, the when, when, when you work on comedies, Yeah. I mean, actors always say this because it's true. Comedies are terribly serious. And conversely, when you're working on a thing about a great famine, you have a ball. <laughs> I mean, I mean that. I'm not, I'm not being funny. You're always laughing. You're giggling. It's gallows humor. You have to. Yeah. Uh, you know, it would be the same, if, you know, when, I promise you, when they shot Schindler's List, those actors would have been falling around laughing. Most days, and conversely, if you work on a Mel Brooks thing, or if you work on something that's, that's full of jokes, everyone is tense as hell all the time. Mm -hmm. Because it's a comedy. I don't like doing comedies. Because well, you can't enjoy them. You can't enjoy doing them. And everyone around you is like, you know, because can, comedies can go one of two ways. They're either funny or they ain't. And so everybody com com is consequently is really, really tense. Yet, you know, the best, you, there's, actors in the, there's an actor in the front just nodding. It's yeah. true. Yeah. The best things to work on are the most serious subjects you can picture. You know, work on something with zombies in it. Work on something with like, you know, about concentration camps. You'll have a ball. <laughs> Guaranteed. Everybody will be in a chipper mood every single day. Because you have to be. It's just the way it is. There you go. We were all tense on it. Yeah. Now, next question, because you mentioned something related to World War II. You were in three World War II projects within the same year. Concentration camps. Sorry. I had to run with that. Segue. Nice segue. Yeah. <laughs> Churchill winning the war, losing the peace, and a guest star gig on Bletchley Circle. Um, how, did those, how, how did those three projects kind of come together at the same time? I was in Bletchley Circle for, for about... One second. For, yeah. Literally. I was killed in the first shot. <laughs> Oh, no. Sorry. They're the kind of gigs you want, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then they talk about you for the, rest of the, for the rest of the thing. I really wanted to do that because if they, they showed, I don't know, for those of you that might not know, Bletchley was the house, um, whatever, 30 miles outside of London where they got all these boffins together. You know, they found these people and they cracked the German Enigma code. It was, that was yeah. the, the place. Um, and, they, and this series, they shot it in the place, you know? So me being like, Amateur history buff. I really just wanted to, even if I was a corpse for the whole thing, um, I wanted to go to this building. Um, yeah, that was a hoot. I like that. 
And then one of them is a voiceover project for a documentary. Like how, how. Do, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, how, that's my other life. Yeah. How is it being a voice actor versus on screen? You can wear your own clothes <laughs> mostly or do it in no clothes. Uh, um, oh. <laughs> which, which happens. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Unintentional. She had a spasm then. She had a little. She had a little shoulder spasm. Oh God! Just take um, I I like doing the voice work. You I do? like it. Uh, yeah. Um, in fact, I think I prefer it. That's interesting. Isn't yeah. It? The more the older I get, I kind of just like. Uh, again, um, Christina here is another voice actor. We've spent the weekend together, yeah. um, and it's it's true, isn't it? It's the life. If you can get voice work, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege. And it's a good thing to be good at. It's a good thing to, you know, so I'll do. Yeah, and you have narrations for stuff. And, but you do, what do you do? You do um, animations and video games. Yeah. That's the gig I want. What video? If you had a chance to... Be see me later. See me, see me after school. Yeah. yeah. If you had a chance to voice over a video game, what, which one would you pick? What's that one uh, my kids were, Zelda. Ooh. Zender, Zelda, the, the old, Zelda, Zelda, yeah. Zelda. Yeah. That's a good yeah, one. That, yeah. Solid that choice. For my kids. Yeah. Now, as an actor, you've taken a lot of bit roles here and there, but one of my favorite appearances of you most recently was um, Archie Addington in McDonald and Dodds. What was that experience like? Oh, gee, is that, was that my name? Yeah, because you were because you owned the. So basically, McDonald and Dodds is a police drama set oh, in yeah, 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 Bath, yeah, yeah. and you and so that screens here. A, McDonald and Dodds screens here. Yeah, it does on Britbox. We have it. It's one of my favorites. Um, that's why I was like, oh my god, it's the doctor when he popped up. He plays a fake version of the Formula One racing company, so it's a whole like parody of it. And then there's a murder. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one of these crime of the week shows, of course. So there's am, always I, a am I the am I the murderer? In, oh yeah. It's always, yeah. yeah. I've just spoiled it for you. We you, just don't, you, don't, one you don't have to Sorry. watch it now. <laughs> Sorry, I'll go watch it. It's great. It's but it's favorite. like, whenever they need someone that, like, you, you, you wouldn't believe butter melted and all that kind of thing, but he ends up being the murderer. <laughs> they always ask me to do it. <laughs> That's been my gig for like 30, 40 years. Yeah. yeah. And it was one of them. So, do you, are you a crime drama fan or are you just like popping in? And a what fan? A crime drama fan or are you just like. No, my play? wife is though. My wife, that's my wife's thing. She watched like police procedurals and. Um, but like three days on end. <laughs> I just go out cycling and just leave her to it and she's like. <laughs> like noir and Scandi dramas and that kind of thing. No, it's not my thing. Um, I don't know why. It's just, it never was. I don't mind being in them, um, but I just can't watch them. Those are one of my favorite things to watch. Oftentimes, I'm talking about the period dramas more than anything else. So yeah. I love watching the crime ones. To you know, I, when I mean, she hogs the TV. But but if I ever get in front of the TV at all, it's to watch football, ah. sport, because I know it's going to end. <laughs> you know what I mean? I know it's actually going to finish. Whereas my wife can be there like four days in, and she's still like, you know, go down three in the morning. She's still there watching this thing. Yeah. I don't know how she does it. Now, somebody told me, a little bit of a weird segue, somebody told me you were a silent film fan. Mm. And That's my other other life. You know, there's a, you know that you, some of you may be cross, crossover people. Yeah. There's, um, there's a world just like this, with hotels, conventions, screenings for silent movies. Now, if you got like unlimited money to make a silent film, what would you do? I'd make a silent film. Well, about what though? <laughs> About what though? Like, if, do you have a concept, or, what? or or would you voice over in it? <laughs> but that's what I do. You know, we're, um, at these at these big, um, there are places. There's the, the two biggest ones that we go to. There's one in San Francisco. There's a, that's a week long San Francisco silent movie festival. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll do it probably not from now on because they're going to lose the Castro building. Um, oh, no. The council are going to repurpose it and gut it and do something else with it, which is criminal. And there's one in uh, a place called Pordenone in Italy, which is like an hour north of Venice. And it's a purpose-built uh, silent movie place. And that's a week long. Um, and it's, and I, I work at these gigs um, doing voices. 
reading into titles or any narrations that, are, that come up with full orchestras. Ooh, Am I wow. selling it to you? If you ever see, I tell you what, if you, ever yeah. see, if you ever see one advertising and you get a chance, go. Because you might, particularly if it's a gala evening, you might turn up with a thousand people, a full orchestra, see an absolutely brand new print of a film from the 20s, pristine condition. You'll see it, I'm not, I mean, obviously not exactly in the way that it would have been seen in the 20s, but near as damn it. That's the thing. And that's what we'd have been doing these things for 25 years. It's fantastic. Yeah. It, do, it's is, another world. Is there world. somebody on your, I wish this person was live today so I could work with them wish list? Who wouldn't put, who, which actor would it be? Which, what, what, what? Sorry. On, an actor? Yeah, like, who, which is your favorite sound film actor would love to work with if they were alive today? Louise Brooks, probably. An American yeah. actress who, um, yeah. just because she was so, um, even now, it's like, it's quite miraculous. You know, Brooks was this, um, where was she from? She was from the Midwest, wasn't she? She was from Kansas. 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 Yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, went to New York and they, you know, they called her a hayseed or whatever the, the slang was at the time. Anyway, she, she ends up making these um, classic, there she is, the great Louise Brooks. Um, she makes these two, three films in Germany in the mid 20s, which, you know, sealed her reputation, made her name. Um, and then just walked away from it. But she was like, even now, she, and she trained initially as a, as a dancer. She trained with Martha Graham, and she was a, a, a Ziegfeld dancer. This is how she got into pictures. But the way she worked, the way she moves, and the way she looked, this is not a, it's not, a, there's probably better pictures of the old, uh, of the Dutch Bob. Yeah. Actually, uh, speaking of Louise Brooks, you mentioned her. Have you seen the chaperone from a couple of years ago? No. Because um, I know PBS here in America aired it. Um, I don't know how it went in the UK. What was it about her? It was about her. It was a biopic about her. Um, I forgot the actress that played her name, but I know Elizabeth McGovern from Down Abbey played her chaperone because it's literally the story That's of right. her did, going to New it. York yeah. in, and training to be a Ziegfeld dancer. She's almost impossible to cast because... Um, it's only, it's, only, it's only when oh, you it. see it her. Lou yeah, later. You see her in these uh, in these mid twenties German pictures. It's like it's like someone threw a modern, uh, an extremely modern film actor into an old silent picture. Um, you know, she was working with expressionist German actors, but like she moves complete. You know, she's she's a dancer, so she moves completely naturally. Um, she works completely instinctively, and they're they're doing a lot of sort of expressionistic. Work and it's like it's thrilling. Look at that look, though. She was like absolutely devastating looking, great looking. So, her that's a great choice, yeah. Now, more recently, um, there was actually this reason I pitched this panel. You're in, even though you don't oh, like is it, yeah, even though I don't like you, don't like crime dramas, I do. I noticed you in a little uh, Massey's mystery called Annika, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is why I pitched a panel because, like, I need. I'm not sure when I'll ever get to talk to someone from a Massey's production live in person. So tell me, what was the audition process to get Jake's role? I didn't have to audition. <laughs> every, every now and again, someone rings you up and says, do you want to be in this thing? Mm -hmm. um, and it's just really nice. It doesn't happen often. You know, mo most actors, has, even you know, Robert De Niro probably still has to read the things. But uh, every now and again, people just call you up and say, come on, come and be in this thing. How can you turn them down if they really want you in it? And, and this, this was a case in point. Annika had been, um, that's Nicola Walker on the left. Yep. Of course, anyone that, anyone that listens to Big Finish knows who Nicola Walker is. is yep. She's uh, Liv Chenka. She's one of the Eighth Doctor's companions. But um, she did this thing, Annika Stranded, on the radio, BBC Radio, for a couple of years. And this is the TV version of that. And even during the, um, in, on, in the radio drama, if you will, she breaks the fourth wall. Yeah. Don't ask me how she does it. She manages that to was the most fascinating on the radio. Like she... uh, so in, in Annika, on the TV version, she does the same kind of thing. Um, so that's it. And I play, what, what do I play in it? You play Jake, well, her love interest. Love interest, is that? And a psychiatrist, so? occasional love interest, yeah. She has a daughter who's got some problems. And he, 
anyway, she, she, he ends up, he's the therapist of the daughter. And then, uh, so it becomes a kind of will you, will they, won't they kind of vibe. Yeah. Uh, and don't ask me, I don't know whether they will or not. I don't, I don't know. We've shot two series of it. Um, it's a slow one. It is a slow burner. Um, series two for the Annika fans is not out in America. Look at that. What a couple. I know. they Aren't they? You I'm, want them to get it together. I'm kind of rooting for them together, together. But um, season two is not available until October 15th for PBS fans here. Um, yeah. But is there a little teasers you can tell us about the second season? Well, I'm in it. <laughs> Woo! I'm in it. Yes, I need to be live. He's probably, in it. Probably not much of a tease, but I'm going to be in it. Um, <laughs> And we've shot it already. And um, she, she plays, it's like they've run, I don't know how crime dramas just even, it's like how original can you ever be? You can't be, everything's like, she, she, she investigates marine murders. So basically right? the, the, the Scottish version of the um, NCIS crew. There you go. The, it's always a version it. of something, something else. Yeah. Um, and it's like, Somehow in this little Scottish town, they have three murders a week kind of vibe. You know what I mean? Somehow. It's like yes. midsummer. The murder village it is actually on, my... There, there you go. There you go. My favorite aspect of the British crime drama is like this peaceful village. Everybody's dying. There's yeah. drugs, gangs, all the whole nine yards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. International conspiracies. Um, and we started it in lockdown. Uh, we, you know, the first series we shot in uh, 2021. Was, were we still locked down? 2020? Whenever. 2020. Yeah. Um, and they sent me to Glasgow. We were based in Glasgow, this great city. If, if, you, if you've never been, go if you get a chance. Uh, but it was like deserted. Mm. Uh, it was like a post-apocalyptic. Um, anyway, on we go. Uh, tease, I can't really tease it anymore then, except to tell you I'm in it. And I'm, I don't know if they get it together or not. I don't know what... Ooh, I, think we'll gonna, I think they might eke it out till we're about 83 years old each. Like. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Either Who way, knows indeed? If you were to write an episode, though, what would you do with it? What would what, I do with it? What would you do? Answer, I'd write... write I'd write a kind of gender swappy thing. Mm, intriguing. Yeah, or, or just like with swap characters. or you know, I'd, I'd write lots of dream sequences. <laughs> yeah, just play with people's heads a little bit. Because crime dramas are too linear for my liking. That's what I think. I just, make, I just try and make it a little bit surreal. Ooh, surrealism. I like yeah. that. I mean, Annika, in some regards, is already surreal because Nicola Walker's in first person talking to the camera, but that's even more fascinating to me. Now, there's one project on IMDb called The Undertaker. Is Can you talk about it or can you not? There's just the title, and every time I try to Google it, it comes up with The Wrestler. It comes up with what? Yeah, so there's an American wrestler named The Undertaker, but your new project is also called The Undertaker, but everything on Google is about The Wrestler and not this movie. Is he still working? My kids adored him, The Undertaker. <laughs> and Steve Austin, remember Steve, um, Stone Cold, oh, Stone, yeah, um, Stone Cold Steve Austin, yeah. Oh, I miss those days. Um, what can I tell you? It's about to come out. And I play an undertaker in it. Ooh. Is there, any, there we are. There we go. Um, and as I said before, we had a ball. <laughs> doing it. Because how could you not? How can it's you not? all about death and graves and undertakers and... Yeah, yeah. Um, we just shot it. We shot it in, uh, in last December. Um, and I think the release is this November. Um, what can I tell you about it except... I think it's probably going to be really weird. Weird? Ooh, yeah. Do tell. But weird in a good way. You know, just just, just weird. Um, it's hard when you've just shot a film, but and you're still not sure if it's even going to hang together. You know, that's often... Uh, and then the, the, the filmmakers go away and do something miraculous, and it all just makes sense. It didn't seem to make any sense while we were shooting it. But, the, <laughs> but you know what? As a guy, that's normally quite a good thing. Because um, you know when you sh you know you shoot a picture and then a year later it's finished, mm. your your little bit is just that five or six weeks near the near the beginning, or in the middle. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm looking forward to to seeing it when we get back. Um, I'm horrible in it. 
Okay, so horrible, horrible, horrible as in a I'm bad horrible. guy, or horrible yeah, as in I'm venal. You know, like, I'm greedy. Oh. I'm, yeah, rapacious. I'm murderous, um, cold, and um, bitter in it. That's why they asked me to do it. That's why you know. <laughs> so do you like playing villains? I was them? a shoe in. <laughs> do you this, like uh, playing villains overall? Uh, what films? Playing villains. Well, it's always preferable to playing somebody, yeah, virtuous. Um, yeah, all, all actors are like that, aren't they? So I keep asking Christina for. <laughs> she, she's now my she's my new life coach. Yeah, um, yeah it's always more interesting um, than playing somebody obviously good. Um, the best roles you can have are, um, I suppose, ambiguous roles. You know, as often the most interesting people we meet are people you're not, you're not quite, it takes you ages with them. Often they become your best friends, but it, they're a slow burn or you, you know you're never quite kind of sure. Um, it's the same with, with dramatic roles, if they're well written. The ones you can, what are we, what are we looking at now? Um, the roles you can kind of eke out a little bit. Mm. The best compliment I was ever given, or the one I enjoyed most, and I still remember, um, as an actor was, and I'm gonna name drop here severely. Um, Go was, ahead. Was, my, uh, was um, Thelma Schoenemacher, you know, the great editor. And we met at some, uh, at some festival somewhere, and there was a film on, I was in it, and there was a dinner afterwards, and I'm next to, this is the woman who's, you know, she edited Raging Bull, and she does all of Scorsese's pictures. And um, anyway, we were talking, and she said, uh, and then she signed a book for me, and in, inside, and I've still got it, inside this book, and it says, you know, to Paul, um, who knows not to give it all away, mm. right? And it was such a, it was such a perfect and well chosen thing to say. And I'm, whether she meant it or not, I don't care. But uh, <laughs> but it's exactly the right thing to say to an actor. It's great that yeah yeah. Just don't give it. Don't, you don't have to give it away. The story's going to happen anyway. That you know that the plot will out. You know you can just just hang on to it. Just don't. You don't have to give it away. Some actors, some people, they 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 want to tell you who they are in every in every scene. Um, Anyway, yeah, I know what I'm talking about, but um, that's the, the best way of working. Even at the end, sometimes, you know, you can watch some, and you might want to go back and watch a picture again because you weren't sure. That's why I love watching Joaquin Phoenix or, or anybody that's brilliant mm -hmm. because you, it's like, you, how are they doing that? Um, you know, I, 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 they're, they're riveting, but they, they, they somehow, they're still hanging on to something. They're not telling you everything. You have to keep watching them. You know, anyway, I know what I mean. I... If, but if the, but for anyone that you know that's, um, that thinks they might want to be an actor, that's how to do it. All right, I don't give it away. Don't give it all. Okay, we have less is more. We have a couple minutes left in our. I'm actually going to open up the floor to questions, but keep in mind, do not ask Paul about Doctor Who. This is the not Doctor Who Why? panel. Oh, really? Okay. Right. So, right there, uh, Van Gogh shirt. That's you. That's you. There you go. Give that woman a mic. Um, I don't know if we have a mic. Oh, no, just shout. Or just shout, no, and I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. shout or whatever. I'll shout back. I've heard a lot of short films. That film, Absence. She's talking about Absence. Absence, yeah. Remind me, what happens in that one? <laughs> <laughs> what happens in Absence? It may have been a different title. You're a priest. It's, it, you don't give it all away. Oh yeah, 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 and it's kind of in, it's in like two or three rooms, and there's a kind of there's, there's something quite devilish happens in it. That's right. The wife is possessed, and we had a ball. <laughs> Again, we, we giggled all the way through. It's fantastic. Swiveling heads, okay. devils, and you know possession, and yeah, that's where you want to be. All right, I'm gonna get Nadia here first, and then back. I'm gonna ping pong from side to side. Um, so, um, thinking about for how you were a silent film fan, um, do you have any other recommendations for uh, silent films that you can get into? Nadia asking for silent film recommendations so, for Paul. Wow, yeah, I could probably tell you 20 titles. Um, <laughs> uh oh. See, try, have you not seen Louise Brooks? I have seen 
Right, right. So we've got a diary of a lost girl. Um, what, and the Jack the Ripper one is called um, Pandora's Box. Pandora's Box, right. Mm -hmm. See those two uh, before any. What? <laughs> or even see like um, Asta Nielsen play Hamlet. Have you seen that one? No. 19, probably 1912. Wow, it's yeah. old. Um, you know, it's, it's like. You'd be forgiven for thinking that silent pictures were just those little one real slapsticky things. But in fact, you know, for the first five years, there were already like full length novelizations. They were making Shakespeare's, um, Bible stories, you know, for, um, you know three hour pictures. Anyway, um, yeah. Stuart? Yeah, there's another gappy question. Uh, how many times have you died on screen in any one? <laughs> can I, can I watch it? Stuart is asking how many times you died on screen and I've stacks of times on screen. And can you watch it? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been shot, I've been gassed, I've been strangled. Um, <laughs> and, and giggled all the way through. Yeah. I've been hung. Wow. Yeah. Anyway. Happy days. Uh, <laughs> I, you know what? I've also um, I've also killed Ooh. We we had this we had this conversation once, and some actors were bragging that they'd you know who'd killed the most people in one, <laughs> in one go, and I won. Wow! There was a there was a film, and I killed my character killed about twenty boys. Wow. At once. Yikes! In the same. He had a ball filming. We had a ball. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Carol, I think, in the TARDIS sweater. Mr. Bush and Hornblower was like playing. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I, it, it just finished too early. There were still there were two books that we never got to shoot, mm. and I was I was particularly looking forward to them because in one of them Bush gets married. Oh. Uh, and I think, and maybe it was in the same book. He loses his leg. He gets his leg shot off. And I just wanted to be like crawling up the aisle to get married. Like, <laughs> <laughs> leg. But we never got to do it because Johan went to Hollywood to be in. Fantastic Four. Silly bastard. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, well, well. Couple hands. Um, Eric in the back. Why haven't you written a modern silent film? This way we can go out and see a modern silent film. Why wasn't I in a silent film? No, why have you written a modern silent film? I have, you know what? what you, you know who Ken Branagh is, right? You know Branagh, the, yeah. the He's another silent movie fan. And he rang, about 20 years ago, he rang me. He said, do you want to be in a silent film? I said, well, don't be stupid. You know, they don't make them normal. He said, and I, he said, come to my house, right, on Monday. And we shot for about three days. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a thing called listening. You can, you can probably find it. And uh, he, said, he said, I've written this thing. Come to my, and we'll shoot it in the garden. It'll be you and uh, another actor, and we'll do this, we'll do a silent picture. And we did it, and it was terrifying. It was really, really hard. Um, and it wasn't like it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't a silent movie, um, silent silent movie. But it was a movie with no dialogue in it. Uh, and the and me and an actor called Frankie Barber, we play this. We a couple. They meet for the first time. They fall in love. You know, within hours, and they try. They have a kind of relationship, and we had to do it with no dialogue. You know, as it, as the silent movie actors used to do it. Um, and we got to the end of this three days. We sat there and we said, well, if we didn't realize before, we know now, you know, that probably some of the best screen actors that ever lived worked before 1928. Because it was really, really hard. Anyway, that's the story. Question. All right. Duncan Daleks in the front. Duncan Daleks. I'm just reading your shirt or whatever it is yeah, identify. Okay. <laughs> um, so one of the things I love about Annika is this gorgeous... Scottish scenery, they have these sweeping... Oh, that's CGI. <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> we went um, to New Zealand. <laughs> that's it. Um, either in Scotland or, or New Zealand, can you talk about location shooting, setting the mood for... Actually, picture? you know what, I joke, but we, we went... We, I was in, a, I was in a, a BBC version of Kidnapped. Robert Louis Stevenson Kidnapped, and we went to New Zealand to shoot it. And it's set in the highlands of Scotland. 
And of course, it was full of Scottish actors, <laughs> most who've never been to New Zealand and were bitter at the idea. <laughs> this, is, this, this thing is set in the heart. And, and they were saying, what the fuck? Why are we going to New Zealand to shoot for the Highlands of Scotland? You know? and, uh, and there were two reasons for that. Um, one was, it was summertime, you can't shoot in the Highlands of Scotland because you'll be bitten to death by midges, for real. Mm -hmm. And when we got to New Zealand, uh, Ian Glenn, who was the lead actor in this thing, proud Scottish actor, we arrived at these locations, and, the, and the, all these Scottish people all did the same thing. They all looked around and went, oh my God, this is like the Scotland of our dreams. You, anyone has ever been to New Zealand, it looks, it's stunning. You know all that Lord of the Rings stuff? There's no CGI, that's what it looks like. So, so um, anyway, that's the story. But um, so do, you, do you enjoy the location shooting? Do you, do you think it adds that that touch of? I think if it, if it's if it becomes, if you will, another character, yeah, um, you know, you can only. It's important. It's important to be in the place. You know, um, it helps. Um, I know that. Um, like I say, I know that. You, and you can you can shoot anything in New Zealand. But uh, I'm sometimes, I, I've, I've enjoyed as well that uh, like my city, for example, I grew up in Liverpool. Liverpool, variously, in my own lifetime, you know, people shoot, it shoots for New York. Uh, the, it's shot for Shanghai. You can, you can dress the city up to look like pretty much anything. Um, Peaky Blinders shoots there. Um, I like that as well. I like that kind of thing. But yeah, it's important. If you get it right, uh, it becomes a character uh, in the film. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Um, in the blue shirt next to Eric. I was. Empire of Song. I was. I sh on both of those pictures, I, sh I shot Empire of the Sun with Spielberg for about four months. I was in the film, I think, for about four minutes, uh, which is kind of typical. I know when we began, when we began the picture, he he, he, he tells you that. He says, "Look, uh, here's the truth." He says, I, "I'll shoot probably enough for three pictures," and he did. He had units going everywhere all the time. He, you know, they shoot over. There. He just shoots the weather. He, you know, he had three, he had three films worth of footage, um, and I wasn't the only one. Um, some people who were on it for longer than I was, weren't in the finished film. Denham Elliott wasn't even in the picture, I don't think. Um, it's a nice story, actually. Uh, about a year later, when he'd finished editing the picture, Spielberg, um, I was living in London, and we were living in this squat. You know what a squat is, right? We were living, we were kids, we were living hands to mouth. It was great, <laughs> living in this converted pub. And one night we were having this party, I think it was my birthday, crowded room, you know, we'd had a few drinks, and the phone rang. And uh, one of the guests is now like, and this is a bit, it's a big room about the distance I am from you now, and she's mouthing to me, it's Steven Spielberg <laughs> on the phone at this party. And I'm thinking, a nice joke. Anyway, it was, it was. Wow. I took this call and it was Spielberg. He said, Paul. I said, yeah, he said, remember when I told you, um, you know, about being, he said, well, you kind of you ain't in it. Well, you you're in it for about four minutes. He he found me. That's how big this guy is. That's a wow. proper person. These are the kind of people you want to work with, you know. Rather than get some minions, so he tracked me. No one had a mobile phone in those days, but he tracked me down. It must have taken him hours, and he rang me at home to tell me himself, Steven Spielberg. Bless him. Anyway, um, what was the other one? Uh, Alien, Alien 3? Oh, yeah, I was in Alien that three. one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we shot that for about six months. We shot that twice, because... Uh, um, and, no, I've never seen them. I've never seen either of those pictures. Because um, life's too short. Why would you sit and watch yourself? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like Googling yourself. Why would you... I think it was time for one last question. All right. Uh, I'll take you in the back there. Uh, we, we about the sound film. I think that was Harold Lloyd in a biography. That would be, I'd love that. That'd be amazing. Because, you know, he, he um, they called him the third genius, you know, and he was. And what's more, Lloyd, um, he was the only one among all of them 
that actually owned everything that he did. Every, all of those pictures and the rights for all of those pictures came to him. He made more money than anybody in the whole era. And it came to his family. He owned his, you know, all that stuff. What a clever man. You know. And you know the story about you know, when he lost half of his hand? You know, yeah. No. Yeah, but you know, literally somebody gave him, they were shooting a sequence, and somebody gave him a bomb. You know those, bom those prop bombs with bomb written on it? Mm -hmm. You know, the fizzing thing. And it exploded. It was a bomb. Took, his, oh took half of his hand off. Which is why he, he, and for the rest of his career, he wore a black glove on his left hand, but he learns how to disguise this. And it, yet he still did those stunts. You know, so, he, so even when you see him hanging off that clock, you know, he's got like, he's like got the Django Reinhardt thing. He's got like two fingers on that left hand. Yeah. The great Harold Lloyd. Harold Lloyd. That's not Harold Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll say I love how quick we can find pictures. He kind of looks a bit concerned, doesn't he? I love how we find picture references so quickly. Yeah. It's awesome. All right. I think that's it for our panel. Thanks. Thank you, Paul, for what so much for calling down his IMDb page. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. This is Mick Wingert, and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Be sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to have fun and follow your fandom.